Come and take a nature walk with me. We're gonna check out some really cool trees. We're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can live without. Let's go get nerdy. Yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Nerdy. Yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby. Nerdy. Yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Wee! What up, nerds? Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. My name is Ross. I'm your host, and oh, wow, I'm just so incredibly stoked to bring you today's episode. This might be possibly one of the nerdiest things I've done today, which is saying quite a bit. So if you're a fan of forests and ecology and trees and bushes and plants and all the different things that make up these beautiful ecosystems that we know and love so well, then you are going to be just as stoked because not only are we talking about all the beautiful stuff we can see, but we're talking about all the tiny microscopic things that we can see that make up all of these ecosystems. I'm talking with Julia Huggins today on the podcast. She is a forest ecologist microbiologist, PhD student, um, and we're talking about everything from fungus to microbes in the soil that help create all the biogeochemical processes of this world that we all share. Really stoked for you to check this one out. So today's episode is a slightly more visual one than ones I've done in the past. Um, you know, we're like doing some show and tell, looking at some different lichens, some different fungi, um, getting our hands dirty, digging through the dirt, looking for some bacterial nodules on some root tips for some alder trees. Really cool, fascinating stuff. And if you're listening, I'm going to do my best to kind of throw in some little bits of narration to kind of explain what we're doing and what we're looking at as we're doing it. Um, but if you have the opportunity to check this out on either YouTube or Spotify, um, you know, it'll be a much more rich uh, learning experience because you'll be able to see what we're seeing as we're seeing it, as we're looking at it, as we're talking about it and figuring it all out. So if you have the opportunity to do that, I would 10 out of 10 recommend doing that. Now, before we get into this, I just want to take five seconds here to do a quick little shout out, quick little what up to all my Patreon supporters, um, because this whole Nerdy About Nature project is a passion project um, that aims to inspire and educate people about the world around us, the world that we all share, so we can create a better world for everybody. And none of it is possible without support from you, my Patreon folks. Uh, you can learn more and become a patron at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature. Um, and I would really appreciate the support. If you're appreciating the stuff that I'm putting out, I would appreciate you uh, helping me out by supporting that. Now, with all that said, let's get nerdy with Julia Huggins. Here we go. All right. So, hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm all right. Welcome to the uh, Nerdy About Nature podcast. I know it's a different setting. Oh, it's great. How is it hearing your voice and in, inside your head like this? So, yeah, it's a little it's a little weird. Right? It's, You're like right oh in my there. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's super awkward. Yeah. Um so would you like to start by introducing yourself and uh tell me a little bit about what you do? Yeah. Um so my name is Julia Huggins. I um I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia in vancouver uh, prestigious the, oh so so important <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> yeah um yeah so i'm a phd student in my field like loosely the best way to think of it is environmental microbiology but the technical prestigious term for it is biogeochemistry um so it's just kind of like the interactions of the living and the non-living parts of the earth and how that how those systems work to shape the whole the whole thing that we're in. Um, yeah. And I've been there like, this is, I'm in the middle of my fifth year trying to finish up. So I've been here for a while and that kind of right now defines my life um, and has for the last little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. School can be like that. It, it's a bit overwhelming at times. And what were you doing before you were going to school? Yeah. So before that, um, I took like four years off between my undergraduate before deciding to go to grad school and um worked in research for a bit. I was a forest ecologist studying fungus, mushrooms, um, and tree relationships. And where, so, where at, what part of the world were you like, well, here? Well, I was all over the place, but my, so my undergrad was in Portland, Oregon, and that's in this temperate rainforest, same ecosystem that we have here. Um, and after I finished that, I spent a little bit of time like just traveling for fun, but then I moved to Minnesota and worked in forest ecology there for a little oh, while. Oh, interesting. And then... I've never been out to Minnesota. Yeah, it's a cool place. Yeah. It's um, there, it's different. Like there's no mountains or ocean. So right. it was a 
sh- like relearning how to be in the outdoors was yeah. a lots of cheese though yeah great cheese, cheese country and lots of ice yeah yeah lots, lots of, of ice. snow and ice it's cold anyway um part of the time that i was there i also went to south america to do some research in the temperate rainforest of patagonia sort of like affiliated with the time i was in minnesota and um that was really rad because it's like a same ecosystem type but then different trees different species and like seeing how another temperate rainforest works with fungal ecology and a lot of the same things right i had learned about here i then got to see there yeah so really similar climate yeah but just totally different tree species i mean surely i actually don't know much about south america yeah as far as like i'm assuming there's pines because pines are pretty much rampant all over yeah they're not a dominant part of the uh temperate rainforest down there. what are the like main conifers down there um the place that I was in, actually, there's very few conifers. They have evergreen. Right. Um, so, Nothophagus is the the genus of the tree that is the, in the very southern, far south part of the of the temperate rainforest, and they're they're an evergreen broadleaf. So they put out new leaves year round, um, and they have really tiny leaves that are kind of similar to what needles do for. For conifers. Right, really waxy, durable, like arbutus leaves, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so there's a bunch of different Nothophagus species, also called like the southern beech tree. Um, they're beautiful. They're like feathery. Like I don't know. Just look up some pictures of the southern temperate rainforest because it's incredible. Yeah, and they're the same. New Zealand's temperate rainforest is also dominated by that that type of tree. So they have like, um, and honestly, it's been like quite a while so there might be some others that i'm forgetting about but those are definitely like the dominant thing that that structure the canopy there yeah it's it's cool when you are able to travel like around like that and you're Mm -hmm. able to see how how rare coniferous dominated forests are in the world like that's one of my favorite like kind of fun facts over time is just how coniferous forests became isolated kind of around the northern pacific rim like basically like japan to russia alaska down to the Mm -hmm. the coastline down to california and then, of course, like spreading across like the upper part of the continent, like boreal forest and everything. But yeah, of course, and everything the, else is like dominated by deciduous trees. Yeah, exactly. And and so, like you know, we have like the global north and the global south, and there's more land mass in the global north, um, or more of the land in the world is in the north. And so, we tend to think um, sort of about cold places being in the north. But what's neat about the the far south is that. Um, it's broadleaf dominated, right? And you, in, and that's like the main type of forest you'd think of of South America are like tropical forests. But eventually, you get far enough south, and it's cold and wet, and the same, you know, um, physical conditions you need for a temperate rainforest. But you have a different composition of the forest altogether. And so, using different species, somehow the you know the forest still converges upon the same. Um, overall structure, which is what was the coolest thing for me was seeing that I walked into that forest and the first thing I was like, okay, I get what's going on here. Even though I didn't know what any of the species were. I didn't know what the understory little flowers were. I didn't know the names of the midstory shrubs. I didn't know the trees. I didn't, I didn't know that, but I could just like, I could see it because it was a temperate rainforest. And that's the same thing I had seen before. Right. And every kind of species or the species that dominate down there have kind of worked to fill the same gaps that exist within this canopy. Because it's kind of like, yeah. it's like body morphology and evolution. It's like you just fill the gaps that like where the body type or like the structure type works within the niche. Yeah, exactly. That's wild. Yeah. And so one of the research questions we were working on down there was like, so the, so visibly on the surface level, it looks the same. A lot of the same structures and, and niches are filled. And, um, but what about the fungal ecology? What about the things that we don't see right. behind the scenes? Do they fill similar niches or does it work totally different down there because they're different species? Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited to chat with you because <laughs> this is like, <clears throat> because so much of like what I know and have understood about all these forests and I think like most people is just like the pure visual element of it it's yep. like oh like these are alders you can tell they're alders because of the way they are yeah, exactly. and like and everything that you can see but then the mic the microbe world is just like so far beyond yet plays such a huge role but like the average person doesn't see that or even like make those connections no so. exactly and that's why I've that's why I fell in love with microbes yeah yeah okay before we get into that though yeah um so you were You've traveled around, you've done, you were working down in um, South America South America, and yeah. you were doing stuff for Nat Geo, correct? Yeah. So then I, um, 
I spent a few summers working in Alaska, um, National Geographic and Lindblad is the name of the company. They do like boat trips all throughout Southeast Alaska. They go, they go all over the world, but I was working on their Southeast Alaska trips. Um, yeah. And I, I was a naturalist. So my job was just to like, it's kind of like a dream job. My job is just to like be excited about where we were and like talk to yes. people about why it was so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, that so is my dream job. I feel like that's what I'm trying to do with my life right Yeah. Now. You'd be good at it. You'd yeah, be good at it. Trying to stay stoked. I know. Sometimes I'm like, what did I do going back to school? I already had my dream job. But um, yeah, so I, I would spend the summers um, on and off some contracts on the ships and um, we go by boat throughout Southeast Alaska, which is really the ideal way to navigate that, that land right. area. Um, and this is like the Tongass kind of like a long, mm -hmm. like just North of Haida Gwaii. Yep. Yeah. Um, all the way up to like, do you know, Glacier Bay is sort okay. of the furthest North Haines, Alaska. Yep. We go up into that area. Um, yeah. And so we just take people who are really interested in traveling in a way that's much more immersive and educational than just simply like seeing pretty things. And, um, we'd go on little hiking trips and kayaking trips. And of course, everybody wants to see the whales and the eagles and the bears. And I also love those things, mm -hmm. but the charismatic megafauna. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, but my, as a forest ecologist and a naturalist there, my, <laughs> what I always tried to bring in was a pe this other perspective of like, look at all the pretty green things and all the tiny little microbes you don't even see and trying to like, create a framework for seeing this place that went beyond the surface and beyond just the like it's a whale but like why is that whale here why is that whale spending its time in this area what about the the physical and and um chemical aspects of this environment support that yeah why why is are these massive eagles here like they're beautiful and they're cool but but why why are they here what about this forest supports this like the existence of this tiny endangered small little bird that you know right. you came out here to see and but why is it here how does it live here so that was sort of always what i tried to do with with that work yeah because it's so much more complicated like you couldn't just like take I don't even know that small bird you're talking about, but I mean, like everything is like so suited to its niche. You can't just like take it out and like try to breed it elsewhere and like replicate it just based on like a, a pure physiological, like reproducing level. It's like you need a lot of the certain like chemical makeups and a lot of the different species and the way that they've like evolved to interact. Mm -hmm. um, caribou are a great example of that. It's like you, we can have caribou all, all over, like theoretically, but like they only exist in the, the native like habitat range because they depend on, lichen mm -hmm. like a certain species of lichen which we'll get into mm -hmm. later <laughs> yeah yeah um, i'm trying really hard <laughs> I know, I to know. Like, pace myself because i could see just like it's rambling okay. and jumping around um it's good because you need to counteract my effort which or i'm just like i'm trying to make everything about a microbe as soon as you say <laughs> yeah. it i'm like you know what we could talk about microbes <laughs> well let's talk about microbes how did you um get into microbes the microbe world yeah um what was the draw there so it started as an undergrad. I was I just moved to the West Coast and fell in love with the temperate rainforest. Where are you from originally, by the way? Um, Wyoming. I grew up. Oh, okay. My family's sort of based in Wyoming. I I went to high school in New England near Boston for a little bit um, as well. But yeah, um, I'd come out to the West Coast before. But when I moved there for university, it was like the first time I was like, oh my God, look at this place. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I fell in love with the temperate rainforest and then... To be honest, I like I struggled a bit with figuring out what why I was even in school and what I wanted to do. And I, knew, I think everybody does. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, I knew I cared a lot about environmental issues, but like the political social side of that field of research or field of academic study it was like I enjoyed learning about it, but it didn't really call to me. And I knew that I liked science and biology, but I don't know. I just I couldn't really put it all together. And then. I watched a TED talk about mushrooms and I was like, what? Was it the Paul Stamets It one? was the Paul Stamets TED talk. The one like with the oil. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, that is, that is the, the synthesis of what I'm interested in. And that's the lens through which I think I have something valuable to offer. Yeah. That, that TED talk for anybody that hasn't seen it it's is incredible. so amazing. Like it changed. It literally yeah. changed the entire direction that's of my life. That's old now though. I mean, I think that was like 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I still think back on that. Like, yeah, oh, that's I'm like, old. Okay. It's yeah. cool. Yeah. Know, I'm old. <laughs> I'm old too. I was talking about that with my roommate the other day. Like how, like there are people that exist in this world that have never seen Dumb and Dumber and that blows my mind. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, yeah yeah i know 
Um, so yeah, that TED talk was definitely like at least 12 years ago because, uh, yeah, it's been about 10 since I was in school yeah. or undergrad. And so you got into like microbes and like kind of working or thinking about this unseen realm of the world yeah. we live in. And in particular what they could do. And so that was what was neat to me about mushrooms at first was like, they had the capacity to do all this stuff that seemed impossible. Like we have, we have pollutants, we have, um, seemingly like d d damage beyond reason ecosystems. And it feels like how could it ever come back to what it was before? And a lot of, I felt like a lot of environmentalism was just all focused on like, stop, stop, stop. Like we have to stop, we have to stop damaging things. We have to stop polluting things. We have to stop having any impact on the world. And I think that's important. But what was really appealing about the microbe side of stuff is it was like what I could do, not like what I needed to stop, but like we could remediate this thing. We could transform that pollutant back into a, a nutrient source. We could rebuild the soil where it wasn't before. We could clean this water that is full of things that seem impossible to get out of the water on that scale. And that was really, that was what was really inspirational to me. I was like, okay, this, I can do something here and I can work with a, a natural existing thing to, to do that. And so, right. And I think that's where, um, from a, a social perspective, a lot of people get turned away by like a lot of quote unquote conservation or like environmental work because so much of it is focused on like stop doing what we're doing yep. S stop driving stop reproducing stop eating yeah, me and it's like exactly and and humans as like animals as creatures like we're, we're very much like inherently like a thing a creature that loves to do things like we're mm -hmm. always in the process of doing yeah and so it's like it's not about necessarily stopping and doing nothing it's about doing more but doing it better right it's like we can there's there are so many things that like humans historically have like totally fucked up in the last 150 years especially 70 years really like since yeah. end of world war ii is like when it really like yeah ramped up and like yeah we need to like stop operating like that but that doesn't mean that we can't like create a whole new breadth of opportunity doing more to counteract all the negative things that we did before we knew what we were doing yeah and i mean humans have been here for a long time and we managed to not fuck it up for a, for a while and so i think that at least for me trying to think in ways that remember that we're part of the system and we're, we're like allowed to participate in it, but we need to do it in a way that's mindful and, and, and aware of like the bigger system. Like we need to know how this system works so that we can find our place in it that works with those cycles rather than trying to like act outside of those cycles and break them to meet our right. way of being. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Preach. I know. I, I say that all the time. Like humans, like we're just a bunch of wild animals out here trying to fit in and, and make it all work. The only thing unnatural about like us that we've created is like capitalism. That doesn't exist anywhere in the world. I know. Oh like my, that I'm doesn't so exist happy in you nature. Did. So my friends always joke that I can like turn any conversation into a capitalism rant. And I mean, like... <laughs> if we're going to like, if we're truly going to be addressing the root of any of the problems we face today, it's like, that's like pretty much... Yeah. Capitalism's uh, it's a demon. Yeah. And that's a, I mean, it's a huge part of it. I think when you're talking about like, oh, you know, the, so much of the focus on environmentalism is about stop, 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 stop what you're doing, stop having an impact. Those things are important to think about, but also like at the, at a large scale, we really can't right now, like through our own individual actions do much that helps through stopping because the systems are so, so much larger. And you basically just have to stop. You have to ask people to like stop living their life because the system is set up in a way where in order to function, you have to participate in things that are totally extractive and damaging. Yeah. And I see it more as like a reframing the way that they work. So it's like not about like cutting jobs or stop. It's like, yeah, you're going to like stop certain jobs, but like within that, there's a whole framework for creating new jobs and new opportunity to keep doing things, but just mm -hmm. do things differently and better. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, it's not about saying like, don't feed yourself well and don't, um, you know, like have live a comfortable life. You don't have to deprive yourself of like basic comfort and, um, well-being. And it's, instead, it's like, we need to provide ways for people to live healthy lives full of well-being but just in a way that doesn't at, not at the expense of the things right. that inevitably enable it totally and at the root of like capitalism it's it's that concept even if you're like oh i'm not a capitalist like i'm not that bad i'm not a wall street banker it's like still everything we live in like even if you're just like 
I don't know, selling hot dogs on the stand. There's this this like concept of like having margins and always being able to make profit off something. Mm-hmm. And even if that profit is slim or great, like, you know, it's like a good investment if you're making a lot of profit. But inherently nothing in nature works on this profit level. Like you can't you can't have continual growth that is just like limitless. Like everything is like reciprocal and it's part of a cycle. Mm-hmm. It like balances out. Mm-hmm. And then things die because you can't grow forever. And then right. you need something to like break it all down and recycle it and turn it back into substrates for other things. And you know, that's what microbes do. And that's where the <laughs> microbes come in. <laughs> so microbes are the kind of this thing that you've, how did you word it in that, that hand drawn thing that you sent oh, me? Gosh. Um, it's like they're, they're the little things doing the big work. Yeah. The tiniest things affecting the largest scales. Right. So, and that's the work that I do, I think is invisible to most folks on a day-to-day basis because of that scale issue. Cause it's simultaneously too small to interact with. I mean, that's literally what a microbe means. My- micro is just too small to see. So anything you'd, you'd need an aid to be able to see it. Um, and then obe is like, like living, like organism, like microbe. Kind of from bio, yeah, from life, yeah, yeah. micro, and so a uh, micro bio, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like shortened. So it's like living things that are too small to see are microbes. Right. So and like microbiology is the study of yeah. life that's too small to see with your naked eye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The tiniest things that are too small to see, and yet the impacts that they have and the the outcomes that we can observe are on scales that are almost too big to see. Hmm. We don't. S- think in um we don't we don't think in terms of like um nutrient profiles of the ocean or like carbon budgets of the atmosphere or um oxygen concentrations and like you know we can't see those things but we also can't really comprehend that scale very easily you know we just breathe and take it for granted that it's there or we like um plant a, our our plant in the garden soil and take it for granted that it grows and mm-hmm. that's my tomato plant yeah exactly <laughs> but um what's really making all of those things stay in um in balance there's physical processes that matter to keep those things in balance but there's all of these tiny little chemists these tiny little single-celled organisms that are churning out chemical reactions on like incredibly rapid time scales and cranking those out constantly to maintain or shift if the ecosystem is in the process of changing sometimes microbes are the agents that shift us into a new regime but either way they are the ultimate like regulators of a lot of these um really large scale right systems that sustain life on this planet and it's just beyond like the kind of realms of like human perceptions either too small or too big mm-hmm. we're kind of like right in the middle seeing the things that are like invisible yeah and once you start to have that framework of the world you see it everywhere you start to realize that it is in- actually everywhere um but until you start to think about the invisible parts it's really hard to even know that you don't know it there right yeah and yeah it's like as soon as you know as soon as you're made aware of something you're like you see it everywhere yeah you hear a new word and then you Mm -hmm. hear that word five times that week exactly and that's why i'm the mushroom person to a lot of my friends even though i don't actually work on mushroom research anymore is like i still i see them everywhere i'm like well you know what actually does that that's a fungus did you know if you break this log apart the reason it smells like that that's a fungus did you know when this thing breaks down and decomposes that's a bacteria that's doing it you know because i just see it everywhere now and isn't um do you know about the smell of like fresh spring rain Mm -hmm. like what causes that isn't that's like microbes in the soil right that are like from my understanding do you want me to give you like my you can i i actually i you should go for it because I don't know this on like a technical level. I've also heard about it though. Yeah, so. I don't know anything technical about it either. Other than it's they're like microbes in the soil and they're dry. And when the weather warms up and the rain starts to fall, um, <clears throat> they're like looking for new habitat and that like cues them to like reproduce. So that smell is actually them like it's like is it their sp- like spores or? Well, I'm not sure. So actually, I don't know if it's their spores or secondary metabolite compounds that they just like give off because a lot of these organisms live in a dormant stage where they're not quite dead, but they're not actively living. And as soon as they get wet, they kind of like 
come back to life. And in that process, I think they give off a lot of, um, yeah, different secondary compounds that are just, there could be signaling in those. It could be spores also. Um, but it could be, I could also see it as like, um, signaling molecules. Cause a lot of like spores, so a lot of fungus have lots of spores and those spores need to find each other to, um, reproduce sexually but it's like a weird fungus sex so there's like thousands of genders and like it's so crazy and cool and so there could be a lot of that as well going on of like you know hey i'm over here you know i i, I don't actually know the details of it so i'm not going to pretend that i do and fair enough i just find that like really cool that it's um it's almost universal i don't know if it's like the same species wherever you are in the world but like you know i've been in like montana and smell like those mm -hmm. fresh spring rains and it's exactly like out here on the coast and it's like radically different ecosystems and ecotypes but then there's just like this similar like and, yeah. and everybody knows that smell yeah like, whatever it is it's definitely microbial and now i want to go learn like look up the yeah. details so i can come back to you with like a full answer on yeah, it yeah do it yeah I'll, maybe i'll try to include it at the yeah. end here and like say something about yeah. it yeah all right so i did a really quick fact check on the smell of rain here to clarify what we're rambling about and it's a smell called petrichor which is mainly caused by an organic compound called geosmin and as it turns out we're not the only critters who thinks it smells nice see geosmin is released by a bacteria in the genus streptomyces which live in soils all around the world and it attracts consumers like springtails who eat the bacteria but in doing so they also spread its spores all throughout the soil so that it can reproduce and continue to spread its genes pretty dang neat so you started working into fungi and then you got into microbes in general which is just mm -hmm. anything small and living which is mostly fungi and algae like yeah bacteria so bacteria there's there's technically like three you could include like tardigrades and stuff like that like little critters that like yeah yeah some so the boundary of what is a microbe really depends on where you draw that line of what's invisible too small to see there's tons of tiny animals that um we like zooplankton right is ridiculously diverse i know relatively little about the and phytoplankton like so yeah so zooplankton just means animal like tiny things so and plankton means like free floating so basically they're too small to really control where they go right right so zooplankton are like small animals that float or small animal like organisms that kind of are around and then phytoplankton phyto are plant, plant like, like. Yeah. yeah um and so those are those are eukaryotes meaning they're like more complicated, usually multicellular organisms. There can be single-celled eukaryotes, but those are those are similar to us. So, like, um, and what we normally think of as like complex life, and then and fungus are in that group as well. So, fungus are complex cells um, and often multicellular. And then there's the simple life or the prokaryotes, which are um, bacteria and archaea. Single cell organisms. Yeah, single celled, relatively simple cell structure. So they don't have like organelles and everything the same way. They just kind of like a little sack of enzymes. <laughs> a little sack of enzymes. Yeah, exactly. I wonder um, if they would appreciate being described like that. <laughs> I think I think they wouldn't mind. Yeah. There, there's beauty in their simplicity. Yeah, yeah. They can do so many things be actually because they're so simple. The simplicity of those cells allows them to kind of like adapt and and um well not the cells themselves don't adapt but like the lineages of these organisms over time have evolved to have ridiculously diverse capacity in terms of metabolisms and what they can um do with their environment that's so far beyond what the complex life can do so we're all over here like look at us we're so cool complex big multicellular organisms we have consciousness yeah <laughs> Yeah. In capitalism. Yeah. We have consciousness in capitalism. <laughs> Suck it, trees. <laughs> um, but really, when it comes to like on a metabolic functional level, um, complex organisms, we do relatively little. We breathe oxygen for the most part and we like eat carbon. We metabolize carbon. But even that isn't like fully us because a lot of the way that we digest and break things down is the microbes in our guts. That That's true. That's true also. So it's not even like like we are what we are because of everything that we can't see. Yeah. And so what our cells and like the human cells in our body can do is break down simple carbon structures um, and use oxygen to to respire. To We breathe oxygen. We respire oxygen to use that to break down the carbon. And that's for the most part, most complex life 
lives on that reaction with a few variations. Um, and everything else that gets done, like all the transformations with like um, nitrogen and methane and um, sulfur and all of these other things that are really important for recycling and breaking down and metabolizing, that's all done by these simple cells that are like, yeah, they're just a simple little sack of enzymes, but they can do incredible chemistry. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, the bacteria, which are everywhere. We often think about bacteria in our bodies because that's how we kind of came to know about them through making us sick. But there's actually bacteria, way more bacteria in the world in all other kinds of environments. And then archaea, um, also everywhere, but we typically associate them with like the extreme environment. So like they're the things living in hot springs or like um, deep sea vents and things like that. Or even ice. And ice. Yeah. yeah. But in the Arctic. Yeah. But to be honest, like archaea are not isolated to just the extreme environments. They're kind of everywhere as well. Right. They just are the only ones that can really live in those extreme environments. Yeah. A lot of bacteria more so than we originally appreciated can, can handle most of those extreme environments as well. But the most extreme of the extremes are often archaea. So microbes play this intricate role within all of these ecosystems. How did you go from that microbe loving thing and take that into like forest ecology? And like, where does that kind of fit in? How do, how do microbes play a role within these forests? Everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, Simple answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> what I really love about it is that, um, as I was talking about earlier, I fell in love with forests as like a, a visual thing and, and, and a space to be in that I really liked. And then the biology was interesting to me. So I started learning about the plants and, and, um, you know, like, why is this thing here and why is it there? But every question, kept, if you really wanted to follow it further down the path of why, like, okay, but, but why is that tree here? But why is the soil like that in a way that supports that tree? why is the nutrient composition of the soil that way and such that it supports that tree? Like you go further and further down that why, and at the root of it, almost without fail, there's a microbial process at play that was the why. And um, fungus was also at the same time, like super interesting to me for all the environmental reasons and stuff we were talking about before. But then I, I just kind of like over time realized that the questions I was actually most interested in asking and learning about were the the behind the scenes processes that were making this environment be the way be have the conditions that would support it to look like the thing that I knew it as. Like it's, it's easy to just like walk through a forest and be like, it is this way just cause it is, you know, the alder trees grow in an alder tree grove. And then, you know, the cedars are over there because that's how they grow. But every time I wanted to really get it, like, why, why even is there a temperate rainforest? Why, how can we support this massive amount of biomass here? You know, and like all of those questions kept coming back to, again, I don't want to, I could, I could argue that microbes are the only thing that matters. There are lots of physical processes that matter, like the rain and the topography of the mountains creating the, the, the climate. Like it's, it's not literally like microbes drive everything, but many of the um, the deeper explanations for why things are the way they are. Is because of microbes. Came back to microbes. Hmm. Yeah. So one that I really liked um, or like that was interesting to me right away as an undergrad were alder trees. And I actually did my undergraduate Look at these beauties. thesis on um, the fungus associated with alder tree roots. But alders are really neat because they is have it a fungus or a bacteria. There's both. Whoa. So it's about, yeah. So what's cool about what what's cool about alder trees is that they have symbiotic fungus on their roots, um, mycorrhizae, right? But they also host this other totally different type of microbe, a bacteria, um, that fix nitrogen. And they're one of the only trees, um, one of the only plants, and definitely the only tree, at least in this type of temperate rainforest, that has nitrogen fixing microbes on its roots. Right. And so that combination of microbes cr makes, gives these trees like a really cool role in this ecosystem. And we know about that. We know like, oh yeah, all their trees, they're like early succession. They can establish in nutrient poor soils and, um, you know, they, they don't last for a long time. Eventually they give way to like conifer dominant forests and we know a lot of those patterns we can describe them but the why is, is comes down to their microbes yeah well and yeah I, because 
there's so much to talk about here. I mean, you can <laughs> see this happening, like right here, like that's a like pretty decent Sitka spruce here. But like there are these couple cedars that we have kind of here that have like grown in the understory. Like these mm -hmm. alders are kind of aging out. They're probably about 40, 50 years old. Yeah. Um, and the reason that nitrogen is so important to these soils as I've said many times in many videos before, <laughs> um, nitrogen is like a key ingredient for um, chlorophyll, which trees need to photosynthesize. And if there's no nitrogen in the soil, none of these big conifers would be able to grow. Mm -hmm. So after disturbance, alders are super important to come in and help fix that nitrogen in the soil. Yep. And so <clears throat> I guess like when it comes to forest succession, do we want to start at the, let's start at the very beginning, like primary okay. succession, glaciers just retreated. Yep. I mean, to a lot of people, that would look like a very dead environment because it's like just like rocky boulders. Yep. Um, and silt and right. ground up rock debris. But that's like a prime example of how um, microbes and lichens and yep. stuff like begin the exactly. process of like rehabilitating an ecosystem or creating, creating an ecosystem. It from, yeah. from I don't want to say nothing because all my geologist friends will be like, rocks aren't nothing, but <laughs> right. I'm like, okay. Um, Tell me about that. Let's, so yeah. how, do, how do rocks become dirt? Yeah. Well, so the first thing, of course, like you said, is a microbe. Um, yeah, we, we have to start breaking down this, this rock debris. And some of that happens physically, like through the grinding of the glacier and all of that. Um, but chemically, like there's a lot of nutrients in rocks, like minerals that are necessary for life. Um, and that weathering can happen abiotically. It can, you know, just the... Abiotically um, isn't without life. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. I'm, I'm just popping in to try to yeah, yeah. clarify it for the folks who may not know. Yeah. Things that don't involve microbes. Some things are, yeah, abiotic, no life needed for the process to happen. But um, a lot of the weathering that does happen early on is from the first microbes that, that get set up in that space. And um, one of, not the only first one, but one of the first ones to be able to, to live in these environments are lichens. And we often talk about lichens like they're one thing, but what's really cool is they're not. They are, they only exist when a fungus and a photosynthesizing microbe, like a cyanobacteria, for example, live symbiotically. And what's so cool about lichens is in a lab, we can isolate the fungus and grow it separately. We can isolate the photobiont the um the, the cyanobacteria and grow it separately and neither of them look like a lichen interesting so they only take the shape of a lichen when the two are like married together yeah so a lichen is is an emergent property of these two organisms living and growing and often reproducing together like lichens will produce little packages that contain fungus and cyanobacteria together that can then go grow a new lichen. Yeah, because I've always been curious about that. So like the spores on a lichen, because they reproduce like a fungus would like through spores, right? Yes, they can. They can. Okay. Not all of them, but most yep. of them. Yeah. Um, so those little spore packages contain the like building blocks of a fungus and the bacteria? Yeah. So I don't know... I'm not a, a lichenologist. I don't know if the technical term is correct to call them still spores or not. I don't know yeah. because uh, I think a spore is very specific in I what it is. I think it's a spermatophore. So they can produce little like propagules, if you want, like little packages. They're just yeah. like little nuggets little of like envelope a envelope of things of, a, of some fungus and some um, cyanobacteria or algae um, and now we know there's often other microbes. It's not just the two of them. Sometimes lichens are actually like five or six microbes all living together. So sometimes those other symbionts will kind of go along for the ride as well. Um, yeah, and they can and they can reproduce like that. So in a way, they end up acting like their own organism. They act like like an individual, but they're actually like completely different things. Like. They are from diff completely different branches of life. It's not even like two plants living together or something. It's like a fungus and a bacteria are almost as different as like any t two things. They're so far apart evolutionarily, and yet they found a way to grow together and live and form this thing that we call lichen. That raises some really in interesting taxonomy questions. Like how do you define a species of lichen if it's comprised of different species of fungus and bacteria? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time they do it based on the fungus. They... they um, but 
Because like there are so many species of Lobaria that like look the same but different colorations. Like is that all? Is it basically is Lobaria like the species of fungus? And then the different species are just based on what type of bacteria they have in them. I think so. Yes. Wow. So I, as a scientist, I'm always nervous to be like, yes, this is the truth because I don't actually study it, and so I can't. And so and also when it comes to taxonomy and microbes, as soon as I say something, there's someone else is like, nope, we've renamed them. That's not the right. thing anymore. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I will never make strong claims about the, uh, like, those little fine branches of the oh tree of God. life are always interchanging. Yeah. That's like not the kind of science I do. And I admire the folks that do it, but it definitely kills me every time. I'm like, I've learned a, a Latin name for this thing. And as soon as I've like got it down, someone else has like regrouped it and split it into five categories and reclassified it. Right. So yeah, I think with those lichens a lot of the time they are um based on the fungal species but the same fungus can also associate with multiple different photobionts so photo meaning light and um photosynthetic and then bion is symbiont so like they can have so, uh, uh, partners uh, so i'm just trying to break it down and yeah and even further well yeah. no and then just like summarize that so a photobiont is a living thing that gets its energy from sunlight yeah that is symbiotic in this case the biont is right. the symbiont right so the photobiont is the the light partner the partner that deals with light and gotcha. and so their job in the symbiosis is to take in light energy um and produce comp carbon compounds that are then used as energy um both by the fungus and by the by the light so they so they make they make the carbon and then the, the fungus's job is to provide structure actually like create a, f a big physical space for those photobionts to live on and um, retain some humidity, right? So they are, they form sort of a layer over this film of, of bacteria photobiont cells. They grow over the top and sort of pr provide a protective layer that also keeps them nice and moist. And while, st while still allowing sunlight to come in. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, the, the fungus sort of provides the space and the photobiont provides the, um, the food through energy that it gets from the sun. And then of course, like I mentioned, there's actually a bunch of other microbes that play other important roles as well. Um, and in addition to getting energy from the sun, those, the cyanobacteria in a lichen um, often also can fix nitrogen. So they can do two things. They can pull carbon out of the air and make carbon molecules like sugars, and they can pull nitrogen out of the air and turn it into forms of nitrogen that are usable. Um, and that's the big one. I realize how far off this tangent we are because the question was about primary succession, but fine that's we'll come back to it where that you know that is bringing that back full circle to the primary succession piece is that nitrogen the ability to pull the nitrogen out of the air and turn it into usable forms of nitrogen um is key in early succession because carbon is is everywhere and there are a lot more organisms that can fix carbon basically anything that can photosynthesize can fix carbon but the ability to fix nitrogen and when i when i say fix i'm just talking about like turning it into like a physical thing taking it from a gaseous gaseous form to like housing it in a biomass compound. yeah sure exactly yeah. um and and nitrogen is really hard to do so nitrogen in the air is everywhere and it's like almost 80 percent of the of um, the atmosphere so it would seem like why would we have a shortage of nitrogen but we can't use it in that mm. form it's, it's like locked up and yeah, we don't have a way of fixing it exactly there's two nitrogens and they're triple bonded together and that bond is like impossible for pretty much all living organisms to break and use and then some little microbes have this amazing enzyme that um can kind of like hold those nitrogen molecules in just the right position and bring in other um, molecules to come in and react with that and break that bond open, releasing that nitrogen to the rest of all the other biological processes that need to use it. And God, so, the way you describe it, I, f I see it like an action movie. It enzymes are like that. It's just breaking apart this nitrogen. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so then they've they've broken open the nitrogen they've turned it into compounds that life can use 
and um, they pass that along to their fungal partner. They use some of it themselves. And, and suddenly now where before you had minerals and um, substrates that could not support life, you have now nitrogen. And that opens the door for everything else that can maybe photosynthesize and fix carbon, but couldn't fix nitrogen. Now they can use some of the scraps of nitrogen that are being released by these lichens. To create chlorophyll to photosynthesize in the first place. And start to grow. Right. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so a really simple, easy way that I've heard lichen described is as a fungus that has been able to basically um, farm, right? So if you think about it like that, like the fungus forms like it forms the greenhouse in which it houses the plants that it grows, which are the micro or the bacteria, the cyanobacteria that photosynthesize and give it energy. But basically this fungus has learned to work in tandem with these other things that grow to create like a housing body that protects it, that gives it like a place to grow yeah. safely. I yeah. love it. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then so it works to break down. Well, I, I guess does lichen, because let me think. Because lichen primarily it gets its energy from photosynthesizing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through the bacteria. Mm -hmm. That's like the source of its... Yeah, through the cyanobacteria. Of its energy. So how does it work towards actually breaking down the rocks other than just like the little footings on the lichen that like kind of pull away particles of rock? Does it actually mm -hmm. work to break down Yeah, rock? it can. So um, I don't know if folks have looked into the details of whether or not... They've evolved specific mechanisms for, uh, obviously microbes don't have like intentions, but like, you know, like intentionally degrading the rock to leach um, nutrients out of it. Well, phosphorus is one. I know there's bacteria that breaks, that like pulls phosphorus out of rock. Yeah. So that, that happens as a byproduct of, of um, living processes and non-living processes so like acid rain can can sort of accelerate that process but also organisms when living acidify their environment the process of respiring actually creates a, a more acidic environment and that can as a byproduct also accelerate the rate at which these rocks um break down and release other nutrients iron phosphorus manganese other things that might be trapped up in those rocks that are also necessary for life, not at the scale that nitrogen is needed, but, but also needed. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like I said, if that's actually an intentional, like if there's mechanisms that sort of, they, again, intentionally quote unquote, like break down the rock for that, or if it just happens as a byproduct, but either way they do accelerate the rate of weathering of these, of the rocks, um, that they live on. And so eventually through abiotic processes like <clears throat> erosion and things and these biotic processes, or, I mean, I don't know if you would consider the acidification a biotic process, if it's a result of... Yeah, I mean, it's a byproduct respiration. of respiration, so yeah. So, eventually, these rocks break down and crumble and form soil that eventually makes it possible for other things to take root. Yep. And, and soil, technically, is bits of rock and sand and, and silt with organic matter. Like, that's what makes something a soil, as a loose definition all those soil geologists out there are gonna like technically it's more complicated than that well and then there's so many different types yeah. of like humoferic soil and the, the like yeah the specific compositions and types of soil is like yeah <clears throat> i'm not endless. even gonna pretend that that's my thing but yeah so once those lichens die and other things like plants a few little grasses and whatever they mix with the they mix rocky with the debris, soil and now right. you have soil right and then you've got soil and soil opens the door to like all kinds of life to start moving in. And so, uh, I mean, going from primary succession to... Um, Later stages. Yeah, like, I'm thinking, I'm picturing in my mind, like an alpine environment, alpine lake, you know, yeah. glaciers receded, and like the first things that kind of come in are these like flowery meadows, yep. um, these perennials or annuals that like pop up and yep. do a lot of work to create more soil. Yeah, so you're going to see some moss beds, um, like in little protected nooks between rocks, those are great at building up soil matter because moss also retains a lot of moisture, which is another important thing for things to grow. And it kind of continually grows on itself. So like the bottom yep. most layers are often like the dead and becoming the soil. Yep, exactly. While the top keeps growing. And then another thing to move in early on would be um, a lot of um, plants whose seeds are transported through bird poop. So like... Um, 
a lot of there's probably a technical term for that yeah i'm sure there is i don't know what it is but like (laughs) it's bird poops like a big part of primary succession is like bringing the seeds in um or plants that have seeds that can travel on the wind really those will also move in like fireweed in this region is a a common early succession plant because it has those really light wispy seeds um people always call that a nitrogen fixer i just want to set the story straight it the fireweed does not fix nitrogen i think that we think it does because it shows up in early succession but um lupins are one of the more common flower that you might know that's also early succession that is lupin doesn't fix nitrogen lupin hosts microbes that fix nitrogen right right and same with the alders exactly. alders don't I know, fix the plants nitrogen get all the credit i know well they're the things we can see i know it's... and i do love them but yeah. yeah so then as that forest mature or as that grassland like i don't know whatever it becomes kind of matures it eventually like theoretically in thousands of years millions of years in cases it becomes a forest sometimes only a few hundred years a few hundred years yeah well how evolved the forest though like how complex um you can get alder stands within a few hundred years of, really? of forest succession yeah if anyone if you ever get the chance to go up to like glacier bay um you can you can find other ecosystems around here, but Glacier Bay is an r- amazing example of this because in the last couple hundred years, we've actually been able to like witness and document the retreat of a glacier, and it the glacier came out and totally cleared the whole um, valley or fjord bay whatever, and then retreated, and so you can travel through time from like the the head of the bay like up at the top where the glacier has is still there or is only just retreated uh, to the mouth of the bay where um it's been exposed for a few hundred years and you can see every single stage of succession in like it's like traveling through time by going up and down glacier bay and so at the at the mouth of the bay it's been i think like 300 years or so and there's there's um alders but it's even past that stage it's got some big old trees some cedars and dug firs and yeah so you can but all within like the the cedars and dug firs probably under 100 years old yeah yeah it's not that old it's not like in the late stage of old growth forest yet but yeah you can you can work your way pretty rapidly through succession which is pretty amazing actually that's really cool yeah and then so um once that forest is mature though there are all sorts of like ecological disturbances like one of those big trees falls creating a gap in the canopy how do microbes come in here yeah um so one one role of microbes in that amazing little transition space of a an older tree dying and making space for new life is underground invisible to us is this whole network of um fungus mycorrhizal, m- mycorrhizal fungus, fungus myco fungus rhizo root so root fungus symbionts yeah um that are not all of the trees cedars don't really form those associations but most of the others like the dug firs and the hemlocks and cedars form arbuscular mycorrhizal yeah but they aren't but those are like more evolved right they're just a different type of symbiosis yeah and they they aren't Go ahead. From my understanding, there's two main types of mycorrhizal fungi. Yep. Um, there's arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which would be like cedars and big leaf maples, where the um, fungal root actually penetra- penetrates the root of the tree yep. to transfer nutrients back and forth. Mm-hmm. And then the other one would be ectomycorrhizal, where yep. the um, fungal roots like kind of surround the root tips of the tree. Yep. And those, those like ectomycorrhizal are the more common ones. In cold places where we are. In so- cold places. Yeah, our our vascular mycorrhizae we tend to associate with um, tropical forests for some reason. I oh, actually don't really? know the actual explanation for why, but hmm. tropical forests are more commonly dominated by those types of fungal associations, whereas colder, um, boreal and and temperate forests, um, especially conifer forests, are dominated by the ectomycorrhizae. And so the 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 cedars do form our vascular associations, but those aren't the the dominant fungal network. And so the cool thing about um, the ectomycorrhizal fungal networks is like a single fungus, it's even hard to describe what a a single fungus is because it's just a web, but a single web of one fungus in an area could be associating with multiple different trees of different species. And through that, you get these networks of nutrient sharing and even signaling and communication that can happen 
um, underground between these trees, sort of structuring the, the relationship the trees have with each other that we would never see because we don't observe any of that. We just think like, oh yeah, they're next to each other. But one of the cool things that the fungus will do is, um, so like early on the seedlings, when they get started, the tree seedlings, they're shadowed um, by the, the other trees in the canopy and they can't actually photosynthesize that much. Um, and they can be dormant, sort of like hanging out at, you know, a few feet high for, for years, for decades, even in some cases, but for years, these little seedlings will just kind of hang out there growing very little, um, forming really strong, dense heartwood. Yes. Yeah. But even sometimes growing so little that they don't even have rings. So there was sort of this neat, um, study now it's more well known, but this was a fairly recent, um, understanding of the fact that some of these little seedlings could be way older than we thought they were just based on the ring count because they actually just hadn't been growing. They're just dormant and hanging out there. Well, because the rings are created from photosynthesizing. It's like you, you get the rings from the summer months and the, and the combination of the summer months and the winter months that create... when you add a new layer of growth. Right. Yeah. You get but if a ring. you're not photosynthesizing or relying on that to really even grow, there's not going to be a ring. Yeah. And so what they're doing is they can photosynthesize like just barely enough to, to like hang on. But this was a a mystery for a little while of like how are these seedlings surviving as far as we understand trees that shouldn't really be possible they should have to grow at least a little bit every year to um and so how are they staying alive without um light and growth and the answer was the fungus the fungal networks were keeping these seedlings alive funneling nutrients from other trees nearby the the grow the full grown trees that were photosynthesizing plenty and providing tons of extra carbon into the soil network, into the fungus, the, the fungus are taking that extra carbon and feeding these little seedlings to keep them alive while they're just hanging out waiting for a gap in the canopy to open. And then at some point, the canopy opens up, a bunch of light penetrates to the forest floor and these seedlings can take off and like double in size over you know a few years and just rapidly take off compete and then that rat race for who's gonna um fill the gap and shade out the other trees kind of starts but and that's the part again that we typically think about is that that stage because that's what we can observe happening but all leading up to that was this really cool process that um is only possible because of these microbial networks in the soil and these complicated amazing symbiotic relationships of give and take between the microbe and the and the tree yeah so explain that a little bit more yeah. like so the trees the trees are transferring like this is the concept of like mother trees where the mother trees are <clears throat> able to communicate quote unquote communicate with their offspring their little tree saplings in the understory and send them more nutrients so that they can survive and kind of grow in the understory yeah while they kind of bide their time and that's all done through these fungal mycorrhizal networks yeah i'd be actually interested to hear this so this entire thing is like fairly new to yeah. science at least new knowledge to science and, and so new as in like I think like a decade. It's, yeah. it's at least a decade old, which like sounds kind of old by human scales because it's like, oh. No. Yeah. I remember the first time I went to a fungal research conference when I was an undergrad. Again, we've already established that I'm old, so that was like 10 years ago, <laughs> more than that. And um, I remember standing in line and listening to some people chat about this idea and they were like, yeah, like signaling through the fungal network and I think they do this. And someone else was like, nah, like... That just sounds like they must be missing something that can't possibly be. And then five years later, the paper came out and it was a thing. And it's like all happening in real time. Like these ideas that people were like, no, that can't possibly be. And we're like right now figuring this stuff out, which is cool. And I haven't been in the field for the last five years. So I don't actually know if they've made any more advancements in understanding how that works. I don't think that the tree, the mother tree can like direct in, with intention and sort of say like where this carbon should go. I actually think it's my understanding of it is it's mediated by the fungus and it's actually the fungus. Again, intention is a weird thing here with right. microbes, but we're like, like anthropomorphizing I things know. that don't interpret the world the same way we do. Yeah. And we don't even know the mechanisms for this. We don't know the signaling. We don't know like fungi seem to be able to make decisions, but we don't know how they do that. Like they seem to be, they can navigate mazes. They can like, um, transport nutrients across 
you know, counter to, to concentration gradients. They can kind of like force nutrients into places where they wouldn't be. So they're, they're definitely agents that are acting and making things happen. And we don't really know how or why they're deciding to do that. Or That's wild. But one of the ideas is, or the hypothesis there is like, it's in the fungus's best interest to keep these little trees alive. Because ultimately, once those trees grow, they are the source of the sugars. Because they're going to photosynthesize with the sunlight and feed that fungus carbon later on in life so it's right. in the fungus's interest to keep those baby seedlings alive until they have a chance to grow with the understanding that eventually the, the big food source where they get a lot of their energy from is going to die out at some point mm -hmm. exactly because fungi like the lifespan of a fungus isn't even the same like when we think about like a tree growing old and then dying or like a human growing old and dying fungus can kind of like constantly it just keeps growing right so like w they are theoretically like the oldest organisms in the world like a lot if you're yeah. gonna look at one species or one or entity yeah one organism um yeah I'm trying to think, is that, because I know there's the one in Eastern Oregon. I, I think, think that's you're the right. biggest one. Yeah. But I don't know if it's the quote unquote oldest. I'm not even sure how you would age a fungal network. Yeah. Because um, it wouldn't hang on to the same like dating compounds, you know? Yeah. They may have come up with a way to do it. It's just not something I know specifically, but I wouldn't be surprised based on how, what we know about how fungus grow if they're the oldest because they, um, yeah, they don't have a a life history the way that we think of animals and plants of baby, middle age, old, dead. They just are a network of cells that keeps growing and they could die off in one area, grow over here and then maybe come back if there's more nutrients in that area again. And, and with that, there's like evolution kind of happening as they kind of grow and form new. Mm -hmm. new and you can break them up you can i mean when i study a fungus and i want to make a culture in a lab i just take a piece of the mushroom cut it open and find a little square of sterile tissue in the center of it cut it out put it on a plate and it starts growing and like you can you can cut them up and take the tissue from any part of it and it can grow it's and, it, and it's weird to say like does it grow a new one it, it's not a new anything it's, it's the just same like, it's, it's the just, same thing it just keeps right. growing so it's just these tissues that are alive and they keep propagating wherever mm. they can yeah, i know that's, they kind of they kind of like screw with all of our ideas of what life is and right. that's also why i love them yeah i mean in a way they've kind of like they found the magical elixir of life you know that keeps you living it's like <laughs> yeah totally yeah, it, that's a wild thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, going back to um, the mother tree concept, though, I'm pretty sure I thought that I had read that like Suzanne Samard specifically had done a study where there was like multiple trees in a forest and the the bigger, older tree was actually like, I don't know, again, mm -hmm. if it was consciously sending yeah, yeah. nutrients to its saplings, but it was providing the trees that were its offspring more energy than it was any other trees in the area. So whether that's done by the tree, probably not, maybe, who knows, or if it's the fungus. Maybe yeah, the I don't know. I don't know that specific work, so I, I'm not going to pretend that I like know the answer to it, but I wouldn't be surprised if what's happening is that that tree has a fungal symbiont, one species or, or one individual set of fungal networks that it's associated with and often certain species are more commonly associated with certain types of trees than others and so there may be sort of some selection there of like I'm going to feed more carbon to the fungus that I know is only connected to me and my offspring and not giving all of my carbon away to that dug fir over there or something else right that's kind of what we think happens with alders so they have they have um, ectomycorrhizal fungus on them as well. But unlike most of the ectomycorrhizae in these forests, which can associate with lots of types of trees, the fungus on alders are only on alders. Right. So they don't associate with any other tree, but they'll connect different alders together. Yeah. And we think that that's largely probably through selective pressure of the alder being like, yo, don't give away my nitrogen. It's the thing, it's the one thing I have to be at a little bit more of an advantage over the other trees right now. And eventually it's going to happen as their leaves fall and degrade and they grow older and die, the nitrogen is going to get released. But in those early stages, it's really important that this tree retains the nitrogen that it fixes through its, through its other microbes for itself because that's the one thing that gives it a competitive advantage. It's not good at competing with the other trees otherwise. And so 
I'm not sure if that might be how that happens with the mother tree and like the selective sharing. Um, but yeah, like the fungus network could be giving away those nutrients if, if there wasn't some sort of like checks and balances on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny how we look at, um, mushrooms and like, cause again, that's one of those things that we can only see. Like we think of a mushroom or a fungus as the actual mushroom, but that's basically, it's the fruiting body of a vegetative thing that lives in the soil that we can't see. So it's like yep. only knowing an apple tree for an apple. Exactly. It's like, Oh, that's an apple. That's that type of fungus. It's like, well, no, that's actually like the whole tree is the, is the fungus. The apple is just like the, yep. The just, thing that comes from it just, when it needs to reproduce. Yeah, and seasonally it puts it out and then they rot and degrade. And just like an apple, every year you get a flesh of them. They they rot, they fall apart, but the tree keeps growing. And the, just like that, the same, the fungal network in the soil that you never saw, it's still, it's still there and it's still growing year after year after year. So <clears throat> let's, in talking about alders, so there's an ectomycorrhizal fungi network that connects all the alders here. Um, keeping this kind of grove strong, if you will, because yeah, they, they're pretty shit at competing. Like they need mm -hmm. like a big gap and an opening, like they need primary succession, like yep. circumstances for them to grow, yep. which usually happens around wetlands and damper areas where they like are able to, where there's a lot of turnover in the forest. Um, how does, how does the nitrogen they create kind of end up in the soil for other things? Yeah, so there's a couple ways it can happen. There might be a little bit of leakage from the microbes themselves. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, like as they're fixing nitrogen, some of it kind of just <laughs> leaks into the soil around I'm them. thinking of this sack of enzymes with a hole in it, <laughs> just like leaking out a little bit of nitrogen. Just... Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of exactly <laughs> how it would be. Um, and then the other thing is their leaves are very nitrogen rich com relative to some of the other foliage. Right. So as those leaves fall in the fall and break down, that returns it to the soil. Yeah. And so they're, yeah, they're deciduous every year. They, they release a ton of, um, biomass under the forest floor. They're also not that strong. You'll see like all their limbs all around. A lot of the time they break a lot and then fungus come along and degrade them some more microbes playing a role there yep and so that also releases nitrogen as their um that tissue degrades and then um over time you get more nitrogen available in the soil and then their competitive edge is gone and now they can't now any tree could grow here because there's nitrogen freely available in the soil and that's how you sort of start to end the 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 allness alder chapter of uh, succession the chapter of allness yeah, allness is their genius yeah i know name. i know oh, yeah, that's yeah. Funny. okay yeah. <laughs> yeah picking up what you're putting down yeah yeah i think it's also funny um just looking at like this um fallen alder branch here and maybe i'm gonna try to do some things i'm gonna i'm gonna take a video on my phone so i can put it over the <laughs> okay. video on there so people can see what i'm talking about here um <clears throat> so looking at this fallen alder branch, it's kind of coppery brownish. It kind of looks like a birch tree of some kind. You can see like the old lenticels here. Mm -hmm. But then looking at this live alder, it's white. That's a microbe. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about how, um, yeah, tell me about that. That's yeah, a lichen, right? It is a lichen. Um, it's actually a patchwork of multiple different lichen species. They're crust crest lichen so it's you can't even tell that it's not the bark really at first um but they grow and they grow only on alder trees um i don't know like a ton about the um individual species i know that you can apparently tell the tell them apart by licking them and one of them has a bitter taste and the other ones don't and interesting yeah i i I'm, don't i'm half tempted to try it i there's a couple of pictures of me licking trees that exist you, in the internet have yeah. you been able to figure it out i i yeah you know <laughs> i mean beyond just telling like oh yeah that one's different from that one yeah. i guess it's kind of pointless yeah but it's cool if you look close there um so like look at this patch right here just careful of the uh, step on all your stuff cable Oh yeah. Hold on. I'm going to get a little. So you've got like a little patch and then you've got some dark spots and that's the different structures that the lichen is actually forming. That one right there. Yeah. And so those little dark spots are going to be probably like a reproductive structure of the lichen. Um, and then just over from that, you have this kind of patchwork of one that has all these black squiggles mm -hmm. in it. And yeah. then this one here, that's more lighter. 
Yeah, exactly. And and it's covered, so the entire people think that alders have white bark, but they right. don't. They have this color bark, and then they just are covered in these uh, in these lichens. Yeah, and that's kind of what I wanted to get at because it's it's a perfect example of one of those things where we assume a tree or a thing is the way it is because of the way it looks, but under the surface there's all these hidden things well it's kind of funny you know that joke of like oh it's an alder you can tell because of the way that it is right. in reality it's like oh it's an alder you can tell because of things that aren't the alder it's because <laughs> right. of the microbes that the alder is the way that it yeah. is yeah um you had mentioned to do you want to try to find some roots root tips yeah and we're gonna cut this if it just takes too long to find it we but can, we're gonna we're gonna try think we can do it from the chair uh maybe. it's kind of dense here there's all these lovely false lily of the valley here yeah, so alders host nitrogen-fixing bacteria on their roots. Right. And what's cool about them is even though bacteria are too small to see on an individual level, the actual, like... Oh, I, this is epic. The, the actual, like, <laughs> nodules themselves are clusters on the root. So the root, the woody root structure itself actually kind of, like, morphs and make space for these microbes. And it, 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 you could think of it as like an infection. It's just a beneficial infection. Yeah, it's kind of like a bubbly thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it, the microbes infect the root and then the root starts changing the shape that it grows in and it makes space for the bacteria and it creates a little, a little pocket for it. But they're not everywhere on the roots. So you kind of have to like dig around Yeah, because they're like little nodules, right? Yeah. Um, We were gonna pre dig for these, but we decided to do it I think, in real time. I think the real time dig is, is more entertaining, honestly. So at this point, both Some Julia and I have migrated from our camp chairs to our hands and our knees to start digging around in the dirt. Yeah, this is a really exciting podcast to everybody watching right now. They're probably just looking like, what the fuck are these people <laughs> doing? Bare hands in the dirt trying to find bacteria attached to some alder roots? <laughs> no. <laughs> Who are these people? What did I click on? <laughs> They're going to be like, this is fake. She's lying. They don't even exist. Oh my God, I found one. You yeah. found one. Yeah. Nice. Ooh. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. Oh my God. Look, I'm a mess. Love it. <clears throat> <laughs> let me have a, let me have a gander at that thing. So what have we got here? Okay. So we dug around for a bit. Um, Wow. The roots that we were finding at first were sort of like the big, thicker roots that are not where the nodules form. The nodules form at the tips of the roots. Um, so we call these literally root tips. Right. So like long, stringy bits. And so the roots get really thin. And in that area, that's where these associations can happen. So for everybody listening, just to kind of give you a visual idea, it's kind of like a piece of Captain Crunch cereal, but in popcorn shape, if you can imagine that. So what happens is the bacteria in the soil that are the right kind, they come along, they find an alder tree, they do like a little chemical signaling dance, and they say, yeah, okay, come on in. And the infection, the beneficial infection starts. So, so the bacteria is actually like in the root tips there and it's swollen into these clusters. Yeah, so it's, it's hard and woody. Like you can see it's kind of like tough, right? And there's like kind of has like a root-like structure, texture to it. Right. So this is actually the tree root swelling up with the infection of the microbes growing inside of it. And they live inside the root. And wow. the root provides a safe structure. So just kind of similar to the lichen, a lot of these microbe symbionts have similar ideas. Like the, the one of them sort of provides the safe space and the moisture and the humidity or whatever right. they need. And then in return, they do something like provide carbon or nitrogen or something. Well, it's just like we were talking about at the beginning of it with um, forests down in Chile. It's like there are different, like yeah. there are certain things that just work for survival. Exactly. And, and different like species are going to fill those niches or those roles when opportunity arises. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's sort of what has happened here is like very different from a lichen, but yet so similar in some ways. And so, yeah, they, the, the tree in this case is the one providing the, the physical space and right. moisture for the, for the bacteria. And then the bacteria um, grow in there and they fix nitrogen. They're pulling nitrogen out of the air that's in the soils and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And they're feeding it to the tree. 
And then that tree is able to grow in soil that otherwise doesn't have much nitrogen in it. So how is that bacteria pulling it out of the air if it's underground? Is that why they're just close to the surface? Yeah, so they're going to be pretty close to the surface. There's air that um, moves through the soil. The soil's not completely cut off from the air. Right. And nitrogen gas is such a large part of the atmosphere that it's it's everywhere. So, right. Yeah. God, I'm so glad you found that because I think if I had been digging, like I was digging and looking for that, like I. Oh been... yeah. Well, the thing is, I, and can I, I have a like, look at that? Yeah, you're like, what does it look like? And I was like, well, I can explain it once I have one, but they're yeah. kind of funny to explain. You're like, it's just a bunch of orange little granules. Yeah, it kind of looks like a little cluster of stale cereal of some kind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow, that's so neat. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. That gives me such a greater appreciation for all these alders. Yeah. And just the, knowing that. And the root system are covered in these. It's hard to like know where to dig to find the root tips. But if we had more time, we could start. <clears throat> um, it's, it's usually like a few feet out from the tree where the roots are finer. And you can, right. you can find tons of these nodules. And they'll get big, too. That's a pretty good size one. But they can get like, I've found nodules that are like this big around. How big? It's that big around. Damn. Yeah, they're so cool. It's like the mother of all nodules. And, and so just, what's, sorry. what's really cool is like right here next to the same space where the nodule is, there's all these fine root tips. And right. those are where the fungal association would be happening. Sometimes right next to each other, like on the same part of the, the root branch. So this little part here is the bacteria it, within the root of the alder fixing mm -hmm. nitrogen from the air, yep. giving the nitrogen to the alder, but yep. also giving it to the fungal connections that'll be connect, like the ectomycorrhizal fungi that'll be connected at the tips of these little roots here yep. and providing that nitrogen to all the alders around here. Exactly. That is nuts. Yeah, it's so cool. That is so rad. Yeah, I love microbes. <laughs> Um, while we're just here doing show and tell, apparently, yeah, uh, we did. While we didn't collect any um, microbe clusters before we started recording, we did get a couple little lichen. Yes. Let's talk about these. So this is an usnea you have here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and is that lobaria? Uh, yeah, or some other like um, leafy structure. Right. So this would be, this one here would be a lobaria leafy structure thing. And it's funny, so we can look on the backside and see that it's pale white, as in like that's the back of the greenhouse. There's no, nothing growing there. Mm -hmm. But then the exposed side is kind of has this light pale green, which is the color of the cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. Totally. So at this point, Julia takes the lichen from my hand and pours something from her mug onto it. Just give it a little douse of coffee. <laughs> it's just tea. <laughs> but what's kind of cool is... If you let this sit for a minute, it'll actually get greener in real time because this is all pretty dried out mm. and you can see it already like it's turning a brighter green right. and within a few minutes, these can, uh, within a few minutes of re, uh, hydrating, hydrating, they can, they don't come alive cause they're not dead, but you know, they can come back to activity and start photosynthesizing. Right. Again. So they only photosynthesize when they're moist they need water yeah the yeah. photosynthesis reaction requires a, a fair amount of water so hmm. they go dormant when they don't have it and then as soon as the rains start and everything oh. and they and they rehumidify see how bright green it is now compared to there <clears throat> yeah you know i guess i never thought about that element of it because it's like roots are able to photosynthesize because they're constantly drawing water up through their or, mm -hmm. sorry roots <laughs> trees are able to photosynthesize <laughs> yeah. because they're drawing um they have uptake of water through the roots to the leaves which is yeah. Um, fueling that photosynthesis. But with lichen, they don't have roots. They're not like drawing water up from anywhere. So it has to come from the atmosphere. Yeah. And one of the cool things about lichens, like especially this one, so this is usnea. Um, and you can see it's got this kind of like feathery, fluffy texture. It retains moisture for a long time and largely because of that, because they don't have roots um, to take up moisture from the soil. And so they're really good at holding on to moisture for a long time until eventually they dry out. And what's neat is the canopies of these forests are full of usnea and other lichens like this. And in the dry parts of the summer, the sheer amount of moss and lichen that's up in those canopies retains so much moisture that you actually can create or the forest has its own little micro habitat where that, hum yeah. Yeah, that humidity is given off by those lichens and then recondenses, 
keeping more moisture in the forest canopy than, than there would be because it's not raining. And that is one of the main reasons we can have temperate rainforests because these forests can't handle drying out for very long. These species are very sensitive to that. Um, well, and that's one of the key things. So like that happens in lichen and it happens in mosses and it happens up in the canopy and this added layer of humidity helps keep the overall temperature of the forest cooler. It helps retain yeah. more moisture even on the forest floor. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the big things, one of those kind of big things that's beyond our perception that we lose when we yeah. um, cut or lose old growth forests, I guess, right. um, and have second growth forests because this richness of diversity of lichen and mosses that appears in the canopy takes hundreds of years to establish, even after the trees are hundreds of years old. Yep. So totally. And, and they, they don't grow very quickly either. No. And so to get, um, some of those massive, you can go to places where these massive strands of usnea. Have you ever seen those? Like they look like somebody decorated a Christmas right. tree and they're just like the usnea longimis longissima. Longissima. Yeah. 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 Um, and just these big clumps, they take a long time to, to grow and accumulate to that level. And when you cut down these old trees that host them, especially like they're, they're big, um, they have these big branches that grow out vertically. Um, being horizontal. horizontally, right. Um, <laughs> and then up and then like this whole part that's horizontal can accumulate these massive mats of mosses and lichens that retain humidity and younger trees and second growth forests after, um, clear cutting and planting, they don't have those structures. So they don't retain all of these, um, little moisture retaining. Right vegetation up there and and that's a feature that happens i wish i could almost see one like that spruce over there is a good candidate but i can't see the canopy um like that's a thing that happens only once a tree gets to a certain age and it starts forming a complex crown where you have like reiteration of a tree so the tree will lose its leader in a windstorm or something and then those upper branches will start to become new leaders so they form these like candelabra tops in western red cedars but it happens often um in sicka spruces and doug firs where it'll it'll sprout from a, a new um like nodule like where the branch does, itself doesn't curve up but like a new tree will essentially grow out of a branch and once that happens um that branch has to put on more mass to kind of hold those other trees that are now growing on those upper branches so those branches get really thick and wide and like yeah the ones on top of sicka spruces especially can be like two feet wide on like a big one. They're like these massive like platforms. It's the, like it would, if it wasn't so hectic and high off the ground, it'd be a great place to build a uh, tree house. <laughs> totally. And you know, it's cool talking about succession and the role of microbes again is in the, on those branches that grow out, like you're talking about. And then the, the mosses and the lichens. I start like the to use of the arm here. This is yeah, very visual. I always, think, yeah. I always picture the trees, like they're like walking around like this, <laughs> right. like look at my, my little. Just flexing all yeah, the time. Look at my, <laughs> My moss plumes. Um, yeah, as that lichen gets established, the mosses grow there. Um, they start to degrade over time and create little pockets of material that's nitrogen rich and organic rich and good at retaining water because there's a lot of moss content. You get soil up on the root branches and you get little pockets of soil communities and then the tree will put out roots in off certain of, certain species yeah, yeah big leaf maple especially yeah they grow roots into the pockets of soil that's growing on their own branches and then there are mycorrhizal fungus in the soil associated with the roots that's on the the trees branches and in, right. it's like ah it's just so cool it totally turns your understanding of a, a tree upside down because we we tend to think of like the roots of a tree as the feet and then the body is like the or the stem is like the legs and the core and then like the head is up top but like really like uh, it's so much more complicated than that when you can have a tree that like you know there's a nodule that comes out and this is like, this is not scientific at all. This is me anthropomorphizing this. Yeah, go for like it. Like crazy. But part of me likes to think that every time a new bud of some kind comes out of a tree, it has this like moment where it's like, where am I? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's like, should I form a branch? Yeah. Am I going to be, should I just, should I just be a leaf? Should I be a branch? What should I be? Am I a fruiting body? Or like in many uh, cases, like cedars where you have like vegetative regeneration where they're like, they'll hit the ground yep. and then like a tree will fall over and still be connected to the roots and a new leaf bud will come out and be like, whoa, 
I'm in the dirt. Yeah. I'm going to become a root. And yeah. then like it becomes a root system connected to like vine maple. There's a ton of vine maple around here that are a great example of that. Yeah. Because vine maple will. Um, vine through the understory. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as like they'll like their branches will get too heavy at one point where it'll physically touch the ground and then a new little leaf bud will come out and be like, holy crap, I'm in the dirt. I'm, I'm going to become a root. And it just all goes to helping the same individual organism or that tree and it's the same thing up in the canopy so you have like a little bit of soil there and a new little bud comes out and it's like whoa i can't be a branch here there's dirt here i'm gonna become a root <laughs> yeah yeah totally no i <laughs> yeah. mean you, you're I mean, not maybe. wrong yeah if trees I, could I talk if they had voices yeah they yeah. probably sound like that quirky little cartoon voices of leaf buds popping out <laughs> <laughs> yeah whoa, I think so. i'm gonna be a root today <laughs> maybe yeah exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I could do this all day. I, forests are so cool. That's um, the way I kind of like to like to envision it. And so um, there's uh, Usnia is the common one. There's another one. So that's like Methelusa's beard. There's a common one that's old man's beard that's not the same. Do you know the differences between the two with the stringy of this? Yeah, this one's really dry. So we need to I can oh, get it? some tea on it um, and can try to... I'll let it sit for a few minutes. We'll talk about something else and then see if we can get it to... Yeah. Because that's, that's a nice uh, bit of Fun. like an ID knowledge there for, for folks trivia. at home. Yeah. yeah. Stay tuned for a little yeah. surprise. We'll let this... <laughs> check back in like five. They need to be uh, wet when you're trying to check for this. Um, another thing that I just wanted to note here, kind of coming back to this uh, alder branch here on the ground. So this is the... Um, this is the Loberia lichen that we have found, and we've rehydrated the lower part here. You can see it's getting a little bit darker compared to the lighter part that's all dried out. So it's photosynthesizing here. So these lichen are kind of like specifically adapted to like where they grow. So oftentimes when a branch does fall to the ground, like this one here, all the kind of crust lichens that was growing on it and giving it that white issue have all died and exposed like the real color of the bark. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think, I mean, there's no question there. I just think that's a cool little observation. Oh yeah. And that's a, this is exactly the thing that what I try to do when I bring people into the forest is give that lens so that next time you're around and you're just like, you're just walking and you, and you're, you would normally be looking at the ferns or the trees or the leaves or mm. something. Maybe now your attention shifts a little bit more to the stuff that's the gross stuff, the decaying log, the broken thing. There's this branch that I keep looking at over here that's oh, got yeah. like um, some like lichens on the surface. And then like in the middle right here, there's like some light colors in kind of around the rings. There's this is fungus right here. So that would be a white rot. Yeah. So there's a white rot fungus, right? That's like and colonizing it, this branch and breaking it down. So the white rot, that means it's eating the... Um, the lignin, I think, is the brown color. So if, if it eats the brown bits, then it's a white rot because it leaves behind the white tissue, the cellulose. And if it eats the white tissue, then it leaves behind the because brown. Because it leaves the brown stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then so this lichen here... I think it's not a lichen. I think it's like a, a crustose fungus. So it's like you can kind of see the, the like little... I don't know if your camera will pick it up, but there's like texture that kind of looks like right. little it's kind of like a cat tongue yeah exactly and so i think it's actually just a fungus not um like it's a decomposing fungus of some other kind that's Sapertrophic like fungus yeah that is like going to town on the bark the little bit of bark that is left on that branch and degrading it back into soil bits and so when i'm walking around those are the things i see and i'm like oh my gosh look at this it ha it's like recycling in action right here this is the very thing that like keeps these ecosystems running over hundreds and thousands of years is these little actions well and it's uh, an interesting thing because us humans like we i don't know especially coming from like kind of a catholic um origin of like a lot of western society it's like oh that's dead it's gross it's being decomposed um even though I, it's no different than these trees, like these trees are eating quote unquote dead things in the soil. We just can't see the soil because it's covered with all these other lovely living things like these, oh, these gorgeous false lily of the valleys. They're my favorite. I know, Look I how beautiful they are. I actually felt bad when we came in here. I was like trampling them. They're so pretty. So it's like, 
when we see a fungus or see like a rotting log, we're so triggered to be like, oh, that's dead. Ew, gross, bugs in there, fungus. There's like things growing out of it. Same when you see like a, a body, like a corpse of like a bird or <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. It's like, ew, dead. But yeah. like that is just like a more visual representation of what's happening all around. Like it's all part of the cycle. Oh, totally. And it's actually that piece right there. When I think about to bring this like really full circle to stuff we were talking about at the beginning, living in sync with existing cycles, it's that step that we're often missing. Um, Cause we, we tend to think linearly with like input I consume, I use it up, waste I discard, and then it's done and it's linear. So there's just a start and an end. Whereas basically nothing works that way. Almost nothing is truly linear. It's, transformations in cyclical patterns and sometimes those cycles are spirals that lead somewhere else it's not always a perfect circle but almost every transformation leads to something else and sometimes that's a complete circle and it just cycles around and around the same space sometimes something gets produced and used and then changed and then consumed by something else and then shifted but everything gets consumed again like there's no waste that is just the end product in natural cycles. And so when we think about like how to live and, and live in health and live comfortably, but live in a way that's in sync with those cycles, those are the questions I like to ask is like, what is my end product? Is it really truly just waste that I discard or is it the substrate for something new? What can that be broken down into and re and recreated? And that, that process both metaphorically and literally is like where I look to microbes because they teach us so much about it metaphorically about how to like think about reusing things and what would seem as waste can actually be a food source for something else or substrate. But then also literally, they literally can also help us break things down and, and, and reuse them. And even like on a more philosophical perspective on that too, like, I don't know, there are so many things that like we think about where it's like, it seems like it's a waste or like the end of a chapter, the end mm -hmm. of a life. It's like, uh, but like, what did you learn? What does that, what does that give you? Like, how can you reuse that exactly. knowledge or experience to like grow? Yeah. Continue to grow. Totally. Yeah. This um, is all soft again, if you want to quickly. Oh yeah. Let's talk about. Little, it's just, just a little Usnia. fun fact about Usnia. So this is what it looked like before. Dry. All dried out. Crusty. If you get it moist again and you're ever wondering if you have usnea or some other lichen that looks maybe similar. The central cord there. It's stretchy. So you can see that it's like reacting kind of rubbery. And then if I get up close, this cord, there's like a rubbery strand in the middle. This has got to be so challenging to see with the camera. but It's actually iPhones. I'm like pretty impressed right now. So do you see that like rubbery cord in the middle when I stretch it? So the outer shell... Right. has broken right. but there's like a thinner inner strand that's like really stretchy and rubbery there you can see yeah a bit. well and you just broke it so that that center cord that you're hanging on to right now is that kind of rubbery cord yeah so that's usnea it has that stretchy ability which is what lets it grow um up in the tree branches and like drape across multiple tree branches and then as those trees sway in the wind and they stretch it and stuff mm -hmm. it kind of gives it some some rebound yeah and ability to make those really long strands right Amy. what is it made of or it contains um oh not a I'm pretty sure that it's collagen that I'm thinking of that like central cord is what like gives it it's like rubbery kind of rebounding thing. So that apparently if you like make tea out of that, um, mm. an usnea tea, hmm. yeah, it, you can get some collagen there, which, um, you know, people love for keeping their skin healthy. Hmm. So yeah. I hear. I didn't know. Yeah. I mean. I know. I know usnea tea is a, a traditional medicine that's um, like widely used and has been for a long time, but I don't know the... Uh, the details of what it does um i guess like you're not a lichenologist do you know much about cladonia a little bit like i i know what they look like and i know they're really cool and cute and fun but they kind of remind me of um a little coral reef cladonia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're beautiful but they're like the main food source of caribou right and so that's like a, a big issue uh, kind of more into the interior where like caribou yep. herds are dwindling because mm -hmm. We've logged a lot. Those lichen take a long time to grow up in the forest canopy, and basically, it's the primary food source of caribou. Um, when they when the lichen breaks off from the canopy and finds its way down to the snowpack, they'll dig around and like pull them out of the snow, and, and that's how they survive the winter months. Yep, 
Yep. But since we don't have a lot of those old growth forests remaining, um, there's less of it around. <sighs> yeah. It's intense. Yeah, I think that there's a lot to old growth forests in terms of their environment their ecological services that they play that again are invisible to us. So we love old growth forests because they're also beautiful, right? Walking around in them, the diversity of the canopy structure and the way the light comes through and all the different layers, they're aesthetically pleasing. They're just nice to be in, but there's so much of why they are valuable. That is stuff we can't see. And again, it's, it comes down to these like microbial dimensions that are, that are out of sight, but that level of, um, diversity, biological complexity that evolves and takes a really long time to get there serves really f important roles that are hard to reproduce in a secondary growth forest artificially, right? So we try to do things a lot of the time to mimic old growth forest structure in secondary growth forests, like cutting down trees and creating a, a, a patchy or canopy. And that can accelerate the rate at which we reach that. But there are just some things that just take time. And right. it's and you and it's hard to replicate that in any other way than just letting the forest reach that stage, and a lot of that is in the the micro diversity of the space, whether that's older or lichens that take a long time to accumulate to feed the caribou, or um, diversity of fungal networks in the soil, or the 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 depth and the thickness of the soil that just takes hundreds of years of debris falling down and degrading in such a particular way by whatever microbes are there or not there. All of that is really hard to reproduce. Yeah. And <clears throat> that's one of like the kind of the main issues that we're facing right now is like, even in looking at like trying to rehabilitate second growth forests, a lot of the things or methods used are very much based on the physical appearance or physical nature of it. So it's like, um, you know, cut down a couple of trees, leave some standing dead snags, leave some downed logs and woody debris on the forest floor. All these different things that like aid in not necessarily replicating old growth characteristics, but speeding up those processes. Yep. But the issue is that like when we're still looking at managing these lands for the end value of being timber, we're, like those forests aren't ever going to truly achieve that old growth stage because it's like we're only looking at the forest for the trees. Like we yeah. just hope to recreate more trees so that we can build more things. Yeah. And so long as we're logging, which like I'm not, I'm not against all logging um, no, it's by just any like means. just like logging smarter. Yeah. And so long as we're doing it, we should continue to do those things that help replicate those valuable structures and qualities of for of old growth forests in our second growth forests. We just, I think, need to remind ourselves that those are helpful, but they're not a sufficient replacement for the, the complexity and diversity of a, of a real old growth forest. We need to protect those ecosystems of what we have left because they are not reproducible in our in our timelines. Yeah. Well, and in our kind of myopic way of thinking too, even when you look at like expanding <clears throat> the values that you could manage a uh, forest for beyond just timber to like including cultural, social, eco ecological values, those are still like relatively limited in that like some take precedence over others. And it's like, if, if you were to be managing a forest for ecological values, Tim, like if balancing timber, cultural, mm -hmm. ecological values. Yeah. Like the length of time it takes to establish a bacteria is probably like lowest rung on the priority pole. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, okay, we can do all this stuff. We can get some mosses back. We can maybe get a marble murelet, which would be incredible, you know, like kind of bring back the diversity of the megafauna that we love so much. Mm -hmm. But when it takes, when it comes to like taking the time to like actually make sure that this ecosystem is functioning and returning those different nutrient cycles back to their full capacity, yeah. um, it's a lot different. And yeah. so we end up relying on fertilizers and pesticides sides and things to kind of like yeah exactly yeah and i the thing is we haven't been logging and monitoring for us long enough to really know but the studies that i know of again this is no longer my like area of expertise but from what i know of um the trying to estimate how long it takes for some of those qualities to come back after a forest has been logged it's it's not within hundreds of years. It it may be thousands before they really fully reestablish. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense if, if returning to the glacier question, you know, it takes a few hundred years to even get those trees there in the first place, the the bigger conifers, and it's gun it takes 
many cycles of those trees before you start to establish those really thick soil layers and the nutrient cycling um, patterns that sustain the, the the full complex diversity of an old growth forest. And yeah, when you log them, it's it's not they're not back within a hundred years or two hundred years, those no. qualities. Yeah. Thousands. Thousands probably, but we don't know because we haven't been able to really like track a logged forest for long enough mm -hmm. to see them come back. Beyond our scope of comprehension. Yeah, exactly. And, and that kind of goes back to I guess what we were talking about at the beginning and what I kind of want to like wrap this up with mm. is that like we tend to look at things in the world and live our lives and build these systems that we live in based on the way that things look, based on what we can mm. see, based on how we can interpret things. It's like based on the physical, visual values that we can interpret. But mm -hmm. there's so much to this world that we don't know and are constantly learning about and that are like beyond our scope from these microbes in the soil to the bigger kind of broader pictures that they impact. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see us like fitting in and from like a science perspective, what are you kind of like, and like what, what would you like Im try to impart on people from a perception level? Yeah. So when we think about science, um, or when we talk about science, we tend to treat it like this, um, like this, like textbook body of knowledge that is the authoritative, um, end all be all state of knowledge of things. But I, I don't think of science in that way. A science at least the way that I use that word, is a process. It's a way of asking questions. Um, it's a certain set of methodology of trying to quantify answers and ask questions based on hypotheses. And it's a really useful tool when it comes to some of these things that you just talked about, like the, the, the pieces that are outside of our um, immediate tangible interaction space. Mm -hmm. And so we can use science to ask questions about what are the microbes living in the soil here? Um, what kinds of processes are they doing? Um, what kind of changes are occurring on a large scale in this ecosystem? Is the nitrogen staying in the soil? Is the nitrogen washing out to the ocean? Is the carbon being sequestered or is the carbon getting released back into the environment as CO2? So we can use science as a tool to, to ask some of those system level questions and then um, try to make decisions about how to manage the space or at least how to interact with it in a way that is more in line with the goals that, that we wanted um, out of that space and not just like for our own benefit but like what we want for the for the health of that ecosystem in the long run um, well I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that like science or that body of work that we kind of rely on for those answers is always kind of changing and growing like, yeah, exactly. It's not just like everything in the natural world, like nothing is set in stone, but yeah. that, that contracts a lot or contrasts um, a lot of what we've come to, I guess, embody as a society. Like we liked, we liked fixed answers and fixed things. We like sure, yep. Yep. sure bets and things that like aren't going to like waver or be wiggly. We like to put things into boxes and have defined answers, but that's not the way the world works. It's not, and it's not the way we learn, and it's not the way that we know either. I think we th we're a lot of our school system trains us to think that knowledge or, or knowing things is memorizing a fact and regurgitating it on a test and getting it right, and there's a right answer. And uh, kind of ironically, the kids that are good at that go on and whatever get good grades and go and become scientists. And you don't only have to become a scientist if you're good at school, but like you get there and then you actually start doing science and you're like, holy shit, none of this works the way that I thought it did. It's not about knowing the right answer and regurgitating it on a test. In fact, that actually hinders my ability to be a good scientist if I'm too attached to thinking things are the way that I thought they were. Because the whole process of science is about questioning the absolute authoritative supposed knowledge about how things are. And that's where I, I, I feel sort of sad sometimes about the way that science is currently perceived and portrayed in our world as this like, no, this is how it is and like appeal to authority of science. Whereas real science is the question of questioning or the process of questioning and doubting and wondering and saying, was it really that way? What if, what if it was like this other thing? And, 
Um, and coming to answers that like explain things maybe for a time, but then if you keep asking that why question, you end up getting down to the microbial level of it all. Like you have to you just yeah. figure out more and more things. Yeah. And the other thing that is important for me when I'm thinking about science and interacting with science, using science for our outcome, the outcomes we want or whatever, is to remember that it's just one one tool of many um, in terms of ways of knowing. And I don't fully understand exactly how science, the scientific method, got put on this pedestal that seems to think it's like better and more valid than other ways of knowing. But um, I, I really think when you look at the history of knowledge, it doesn't work that way. Um, it's, it's an iterative process. It usually involves humans coming to know something through observation or experience or other ways that are not scientific and quantitative coming to have some sense of the world, then using science to test something or confirm something or add to that knowledge. But science is not actually the origin of a lot of knowledge, even though we tend to treat it like it is. Right. It's the origin of certain types of knowledge, quantitative, testable hypotheses. But, you know, that's not how, it's not how we came to know about alder trees and where they grow. Humans came to have relationships with alder trees just through experiencing them and living around them and <laughs> observing them. Um, and I guess some people, I guess, this depends on how you use the word science. Some people would call that science, just the act of observing and remembering and, and, but I would just say that's knowledge in general and not, it's, I'm not saying it's not scientific because it's not valid. It's just not like quantitative hypothesis testing numbers driven ways of knowing. And so, yeah, like humans, we have these relationships with our, our world and we come to know them through other ways. And then we can use science to test specific things and ask a very specific question and dig into it a little bit further and, um, you know, test whether or not reality conforms to how we think it works. But um, yeah, I think we just have to remember that it's it's just a tool that we use and it's not the only valid way of observing and interacting with your world. Right. <clears throat> it, so it all kind of starts with like a question. Yeah, it starts with a question and getting to know things based on your experiences with it. And I think that's a really important thing for people to kind of be more considerate of these days is that, that idea of... Um, yeah, knowing can be so much greater. Like, how do you quantify so many of the emotional or f like psychological things that we experience that are like so far beyond our ability to understand from that scientific mathematical perspective? Like, the human brain alone is like so incomprehensible. Like, we don't know what what does what really like we know a little bit for mm -hmm. sure but in the scope of like how neurons function and how everything is like how i'm physically saying this thought and it's like having <laughs> neurons firing and coming down here then into this microphone like there are so many things that like we understand how it works but the mm -hmm. why like mm -hmm. you're talking about like we don't know um and if anything it like validates so many more other ways of knowing i feel like like from kind of indigenous wisdom and like you know experience over millennia of living on these landscapes to like one's own personal knowing and like ability to understand or feel like know what's right for them based on the their intuition and their gut like yeah absolutely and i think for me that's why when i talk about what i do as a scientist it's important to be mindful of the language around it and not say that like I have discovered this new thing and I have explained this thing. What I have done is I've added maybe a quantitative piece to something that we didn't have before. I've contributed. It's not that I didn't do anything new, but I didn't explain. I, I didn't discover forests, right? I didn't discover soils. I just have maybe helped us know a little bit about an, a, a piece of that soil and how it works. It was hard to observe from a personal level. But I think that we often, there's a bit of hubris in science sometimes around that of like, yes, yeah, scientists have discovered that, blah, 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 right? And it's like, well, actually that's been known for like thousands of years by humans. And you came along and gave some mechanistic explanation that helps us piece together how that happens, which is a valuable, valid contribution. But it's just that. It's a contribution to the broad, base of human knowledge, which is much more complex and diverse than simply the scientific lens. Right. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you wanted to chat about or would like to add? Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I would just say like, as you, for folks who are listening, like as you're in these spaces that you love and appreciate, if you can think about what you might not see, try to look at the world and look at the pieces that, um, you, I say, look at them, look at the things you literally can't look at, but try to, (laughs) try to like look past the surface of what you observe and ask yourself like, Hmm, I wonder why. And sitting with the question is just as valuable as knowing the answer to that question. Just looking at something and, and being like, I, I wonder, I wonder why that log is soft and squishy and mushy compared to this other one. Or I wonder why the soil is dark and wet here or light and fluffy there. And I wonder why, like wondering about why things look the way they look rather than just simply observing them and thinking they're beautiful. That action in and of itself is what brings you into that space. You don't have to know the answer. And we don't know a lot of the answers to those questions, but just thinking about what might be happening right beyond the surface level impression is really for me, at least what like opens up the magic of these spaces. Right. That to me is the door to like what literally gets my heart racing. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, this place is incredible because you suddenly realize there's just so much more to it than what you see on the surface. Yeah. And so living, trying to live in that space, I think will like bring these spaces alive to an even more magical way than, than what they do on the surface. <clears throat> and create so much more joy too. Mm-hmm. Like I think a lot of, um, a lot of industries and a lot of things within human lives, like be- things become so stagnant when you think you know everything yeah, and you think that like, Oh, like, I know what these trees are because I know how to identify them, but that is just the exactly. surface of yeah. like understanding them or even coming close to understanding them. And I think the more that you like learn to ask questions about what you're doing and, and like beyond forest stuff, like even, even in, you know, your day to day life, um, yeah, why certain systems or why certain things function the way they do. I, I think that it just, it, it adds an air of humility that I think we all need to be more conscious of and like em- embrace more in this kind of crazy world that we live in because we've in a way like we've gotten into this like quote unquote mess of climate change and mm-hmm. and all these like big issues we're facing because we thought we knew mm-hmm. and we were acting on what we thought we knew and like the way things looked and like the kind of most immediate gauge of of the why yep. but now that we've like dug into the deeper why this happens and why how that contributes to this and yada yada going down the rabbit hole we've under we've now come to understand this like bigger broader um impact that we didn't necessarily mean to have and it's like we need to embrace the fact that we don't know everything yeah and, and it's like, wonderful find comfort in that it's beautiful it's yeah one, it's it's so uncomfortable when you've lived in a space where the where the correct thing and the good thing and the safe thing was knowing the definite answer when you live in that space and you're raised in that way it's really uncomfortable to not know Mm -hmm. but once you learn that it's it's not only okay and safe but also kind of amazing to not know then you open up you give yourself the permission to just be in awe and wonder and like just wonder and and realize that some of the beauty is in the complexity that's so far beyond what we can have a definite answer for right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. I think there's a, a real beauty in like the the not knowing. It makes it so much more fun. I know, it sounds ironic, right? Coming from a scientist or someone whose like entire life is supposedly about like knowing, coming to know things. But yeah. I, honestly, I think I'm drawn to that because it forces you to live in a space of constantly not knowing. Yeah. I spend most of my day as a scientist being like, what the fuck is going on? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I... I don't know what's happening. I don't know why my results look this way. I don't know what, I don't know what that is. I don't know what this means. Like I spend so much more time not knowing than I do knowing things. Yeah. Like, I don't know what the perception of like a scientist like job is to people who aren't scientists. I think a lot of times it seems like we probably just walk around being like, this is like this. And this fact is this. And let me give you the answer to that. It's 36. And you know, we just like (laughs) walk around having facts, but in reality, our life is going Oh my God, I don't get it. <laughs> like, why is this happening? Yeah. What, what is happening here? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And even when you think, you know, you're like, this might be, this might be, this makes sense to me. But the conclusion of like every paper, every well-written paper should be, but maybe not. And here's all the other things we still need to go figure out. <laughs> right. Yeah. And to me, that that idea kind of brings back like a sense of play, you know, it mm-hmm. like, it adds more to the world um, beyond 
what we think we know. You know, it just make, makes it more fun. It brings it back to being a kid and being like, oh, this mud's fun to play in. Yeah. Squish, squish. Like, why? And like, you yeah. just are constantly like kind of figuring out. And I think with that, you know, with that understanding of a few things, you start to understand how many more things we just don't know and we'll never be able to comprehend. Mm -hmm. And it can feel really defeatist. Like, I feel like a lot of people would maybe look at that and be kind of like, feel daunting or feel like they're useless or purposeless in life. But I don't know. I I think that's part of of what it means to not just be human, but be life on this planet. Totally. Yeah. I'm not sure either. I don't know exactly like the magical words to say to convey it, but other than just like, just try it, try embracing the amount of unknown there is. And you might find that it's like a lot more fun than you think because... I fucking love it. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on today and um, digging in the dirt with me and showing me some sweet bacteria and microbes. Mm -hmm. Um, Anytime. Yeah. Super stoked. Thanks so much. Thank you. Wow. Tiny, tiny microbes, big, big nerds. Super pumped on that info-packed conversation I was able to have with Julia. Thanks to everybody who tuned into this. You know, I'm still frothing over all the nerdiness we were able to get into. In fact, I had so much fun with that conversation that I'm going to have Julia back here again in a couple weeks to talk about more microbes, but in an entirely different setting, something you might be familiar with. It's pretty big, um, blue, tends to be really wet, and it takes up most of planet Earth. I'll let you kind of surmise from there what we might be talking about, but you're going to want to tune in because that one is guaranteed to be a banger for sure. So if you've enjoyed this podcast episode, and I truly hope you have, you can do me a solid by liking it, sharing it, rating it up wherever it is that you watch or listen to your podcast and spreading it around all across your favorite social media platforms because Nerdy About Nature is an independent passion project. And as such, it relies solely on support and stoke from folks like you. Stoke for spreading it around and sharing these messages and getting the word out and support on things like Patreon, where you can become a patron at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature for as little as $1 a month. I've got all sorts of great tiers there and prizes and packages from little sticker packs to the ability to ask me a question about anything nature related to which I will answer either on an Instagram video or here on this podcast. So if you're enjoying the work that I'm doing from the videos you see all over the internet to these podcasts that you listen to or watch here, I would really appreciate your stoke and support. Thank you so much to each and every one of you that has tuned into this podcast episode. I hope you're really enjoying this whole podcast thing I'm doing, getting something out of it. Maybe it's become something that you look forward to, these kind of casual, fun conversations about cool nature stuff around us. And I can't wait to catch you back here in a couple weeks with some more nerdy content. I've got some amazing guests lined up. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a super fun time. So I'll see you then. Take it easy. Take it easy.